Plant Strong Pals, I have a big, wonderful announcement to make today. We are over the moon excited to announce our latest whole food, plant based product that we are launching into the universe. And it's made without any oils, refined sugars, or excessive sodium. Introducing Plant Strong Cornbread. That's right. We have pulled out all of the stops with these two all new time saving baking mixes. We have a traditional old fashioned cornbread. And for all of you screaming for gluten free products, we have a gluten free cornbread mix as well. Now, to prepare either one, all you have to do is add one and a half cups of water, plant based milk, or our amazing unsalted sweet corn broth, along with half a cup of applesauce. You mix them together and then you bake into muffins or you can make a full pan of these delicious, warm, and wholesome cornbread mixes. If you've been enjoying our collection of ready-to-eat chilies and stews, this mix is your new best friend. Popular cornbread mixes like Jiffy are loaded to the gills with sugar and lard. I'm not kidding, lard. And they're an artificial yellow color And who in the world wants to eat that? Our mixes are made from ingredients that you can pronounce without artificial flavors or colors, and they bake up beautifully. My favorite pairing is cornbread muffins, and I stir in a few jalapenos for some extra Texas kick, along with our chipotle chili. It's like a barbecue picnic in my bowl. You have to try them together to believe it. Pick up a mix or two today and check out our awesome bundles, including our sweet corn broth at plantstrongfoods.com. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plant Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. I love meeting people who have had the ability to marry their career with their personal passion. And my guest today, Anthony Masiello, has done just that. And I really look forward to you hearing Anthony's story. At the age of nine or 10, Anthony came back from summer vacation and a friend of his, as young kids do, very bluntly said, wow, Anthony, you got fat over the summer. And this was the first time that Anthony became aware of any kind of excessive weight. And then what happened is, eventually in high school and beyond, Anthony would tip the scales at well over 360 pounds. And there were, of course, the associated issues that became part of his daily life, things like trying to fit in chairs at work, airplanes, sleep apnea, migraine headaches, psoriasis, and a host of other issues. But there were two pivotal moments that Anthony shares with with us today that changed everything, and that is when he was forced to ask himself, is this truly the husband and father that I want to be? And it was that question that became his motivation. And today, not only is Anthony a much healthier person inside and outside, but he is also the co-founder and CEO of the new plant-based telehealth practice, Love Life Telehealth. And he and his team of plant-based physicians are now changing the way that healthcare is practiced through the lens of whole food plant-based nutrition, making it accessible and easy for patients to get the care and attention that they need and deserve. And I can tell you, if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me, hey, Rip, do you know a lifestyle practitioner in -in fill-in-the-blank, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, Hudson, New York, Boise, Idaho, I would have 
a lot of money. But with that, let's get into Anthony's personal inspiration story and hear exactly how he transformed his own health and is now paving the way to help you transform yours. All right, Anthony. Rip. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's awesome to be here. It's great to have you. Now, you have, you've been in these digs before, haven't you? I have. <laughs> was that like a year and a half ago? It was a year and a month. It was probably last April. And, uh, but you weren't here. No, I think I was, wasn't I? Oh, I wasn't here yeah, in the yeah, house. Yeah, you weren't here in the house. Yeah, I was yeah, in Austin, right. and you were yeah. here for the annual sports weekend event at yep. John Mackey's Ranch. And you were kind enough to put me up for a night. And you were looking for a place to stay. And so yep. I think you maybe slept on a mattress on the floor somewhere. I did. But I got to take a warm shower. That was, that was a hey. bonus. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so I'd love to talk about your, your transformational story. And you've got quite an impressive story. Yeah. And where that's taken you. All in, over. In life. But before, I want to dive into like... Your, 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 your childhood, your family, where you, where you grew up, all that stuff. So for starters, sure. Masiello is, a, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty unusual last name. Yeah. What's the origin of that? There are a couple. It, it's, it's Italian. Um, both of my father's parents came over from Italy. They're, they are my father's first generation um, American yeah. in our family. And uh, they came over to Queens, New York. My mother's family came over, maybe she's second generation, but they were also, they immigrated from different areas. I think combination of um, Sweden and Germany on, on her side. And my parents met in Queens. They went to the same high school, although they were on different ends of, of the same high school. And I mean, uh, a different age, you know, four year age difference right, there. Right. But um, yeah, and then they, then they, my father was the first person in the family to leave the neighborhood in Queens, and he moved out to New Jersey for a job, and um, and everyone else, well, until until maybe two or three years ago, everyone else still lived in the same neighborhood in Queens, New York, and my father was the only one who was out out of the city. So, uh, probably is your father still alive? Yes. So, what was it about your father? Do you think that uh, gave him the gumption to go outside the? Uh, the confines of the neighborhood. Yeah, I don't know if he was pulled out because of work, but he he was always into a lot of stuff. So he, um, I think he was just a little less traditional probably than everyone else. He was a little more, you know, my, my grandparents very much wanted my father and his sister, their, their two children, to be American to the point where my father or his sister, they don't speak Italian, but my grandparents, you know, that's their, that's their native language. And, and so some of that looking back, it's a little bit unfortunate, but in that, you know, in that era, you know, in, in the, you know, in the 1940s, 50s, in, they very much wanted, they were excited about being in America yeah. and they wanted their children to grow up American. So, and then he went for the job, but I think he was just a little bit more outgoing. He traveled more. I think he was the first person to take my grandparents on an airplane. Hmm. Um, and that probably wasn't even until they were both retired from, from work. And, and what was your father's occupation? He was working, he was working at a warehouse for Fetters, an air conditioning company. And, and Fetters was on a mission to, to basically roll out home air conditioning before anyone else. And it was these window units at the time. And he did some kind of operations work in the warehouse there. And it started off in New York, but then the, the company moved their, their headquarters and their plant out to New Jersey, I guess, where they could probably get more space and uh, a little bit cheaper. And right. he went with the company. Hmm. What about your mother? Um, so my mother went with my father. And then, but my father didn't work. He, we lived in New Jersey. I forget how long. He, so he's in the same house that they moved into in New Jersey. The house that I was, you know, uh, I was born and came home from the hospital into that house. Uh, 50 years ago. So he's in that house. And he worked for Fetters for, for a period of time. And then um, they had changes or they moved again and he didn't want to move. So then uh, he shifted and he opened a bagel shop in Delhi. And that's, really? that's mostly what I remember of him because that's where I worked from about age 12 on was, was in the bagel shop in Delhi. Wow. 
And so yeah. does he still have that? No, he closed it down in about 2005, 2006, um, after, I think, 28 years. Oh. Something and like so that. I want to I come back yeah. to the bagel shop. And if you think that was at all like responsible for some of your weight yeah. gain, yeah. you know, growing up. It, but it wasn't a great environment for me to be in all day long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I can share a little bit about that, about that now, but you know, so I would go pick up the bagels with him in the morning at 5 AM. You know, he, he's a true, um, kind of roll up your sleeves entrepreneur type. When he opened this bagel shop, it was, a, it was a franchise, but we had to go pick up the bagels in the morning and it was open from 5 AM to 9 PM. Gosh. And then afterwards we cleaned up afterwards. So like he was there all the time and my parents split up when I was younger. So my mom and brother and I moved to North Carolina. She mm -hmm. took us to North Carolina. So we spent our summers and our holiday, Christmas holidays in New Jersey with my dad. But now he just had this business, like I said, when we were about 12 years old. And so he was there from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. And as a 12 year old, where am I gonna be? I, I was there with him from, from 5 a.m. To, yeah. to 9 p.m. And you know, we sold the hostess cakes and the Twinkies and we had, obviously we had the bagels and it was a deli. So we would make like uh, cold cut sandwiches and not only that, but right next door to us was a pizza, was a pizzeria, you know, and, and in the same strip mall. So like everything that I ever could have wanted was right there at, at my fingertips. And the problem for me or the issue for me was that I wanted that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my brother didn't. Because my brother and I were only 13 months apart and we traveled back and forth. You know, everything was together. I mean, the, the, my mom used to take us to the airport and the flight attendant would walk us onto the plane and then the flight attendant would walk us off and hand us over to my dad. You know, they had to sign us yeah. in and out back then. And, um, and uh, so we were together all the time, but he didn't. He, I guess he didn't care for that stuff as much as I did or so, he didn't have something in him that, that so made he, him want So he that wasn't stuff. drawn to the... Um the highly processed, right. calorie rich, fiberless, waterless foods like you were. Let's call it what it is, okay. a, cho a chocodile, <laughs> which is a chocolate covered Twinkie. Like those, he wasn't drawn to those in the same way that I was. Um, <laughs> what was the name of your father's deli? It was called the Bagel Smith. Okay, the Bagel, Bagel Smith. Smith. And so yeah. that's a, a franchise. It was a small franchise, started locally in that area, rural New Jersey, Clinton, New Jersey. Uh -huh. And there were only, I think at max, there were only about 10, 10 or 12 of the stores. But he owned, you know, he owned his location on that franchise. Um, did you have a favorite bagel? Yeah, I mean, the cinnamon raisin bagel was always my favorite. Um, the green bagels on St. Patrick's Day, they, they became a favorite. They literally were just green. There was no flavor in yeah, them. Yeah. There was food coloring in them. That's, that's all there was. But, you know, there, there was a lot of fun stuff like that. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> I got introduced to r really good bagels when I came here to Austin. And I can't remember the name of the bagel place, but I had my first jalapeno bagel. Oh. And I, at first I was like, oh, this is just a weird, sick yeah. combination, right? Is this a joke? It's one of my favorite now. Yeah. Jalapeno bagels. Right? Yeah. Also and like the sesame, sesame yeah. seed, right? I, I like those also. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the creative ones, we used to have some of those once in a while. But um, we, I don't think we ever had jalapeno, but I've had jalapeno bagels other place. Yeah. And back when I was eating cream cheese, like a jalapeno bagel with cream cheese on it was good because you had that spice and mm -hmm. then you had that cool cream cheese. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you can tell I probably enjoy food. Right? <laughs> uh, um <laughs> What's the secret to making a really good bagel? Do you know? Well, what, what, the, what the, the Bagelsmith bagels, what they were prided on is that they were real um, water bagels, they're called. So, so what happens is you shape the dough into the bagel and you let it sit so that it, it kind of holds its shape and then you boil it. Yep. And you boil it for a period of time so that it develops like a, like it, it cooks the outside. And then after you boil it, then you can put the seeds or whatever on top of it and, or, or plain. Obviously, the cinnamon raisin bagel is already incorporated before it gets boiled. And then when you bake it, the outside gets a, a little bit, you know, the dough on the inside cooks, but then it maintains a skin. Like you can almost peel our, um, our bagels. Like you could peel the skin off and then you would kind of still have Fluffy the... Fluffy inside. Yeah, you just have the inside part left because of the, the boiling process. Yeah. I'm always amazed when I go to New York City... 
I always have to have a New York City bagel. Yeah. And how those bagels taste like no other bagel. Yeah. And I don't know if it's the water or what. I'm not sure what it is, but they're but they're bigger. They're a little bit fluffier than are. ours are. They yeah. were bigger and a little more, almost like they didn't boil them as long or something like that. Yeah. But, I mean, so, it, it, bagels are a little bit like pizza to me. Like, like, there's so many different types, and I like them all. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Never met a bagel I didn't like. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now... <clears throat> so you, growing up, it was you and your brother, who's 13 months, you said younger than yeah, you? Yeah, 13 months younger. What's his first name? Mike. Mike. Yeah. Got it. And are you and Mike close? Yeah, we're very close. He lives now in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, we were all living there. Him and his wife and me and my wife were living in Bethesda for a few years. We overlapped there. And then um, Kathy, my wife and I moved back to New Jersey to the same town, Um she, her family's in the area too and when we were starting a family we wanted to be back there oh. my brother stayed in bethesda but we still see him on holidays and it's only a three-hour drive so we go back and forth um you know a few times a year yeah so you so you like new jersey yeah where we are in new jersey is really nice wow it i mean we've got hiking trails we've got my wife went and i just went out and did a gravel bicycle ride mm. and we went um we went like 26 miles or something you know without without um seeing a car or going on any pavement you know so like we have a lot of that kind of outdoorsy stuff we have canoes there's a little river in town that we can um you know canoe we can go point to point on the canoes to the next town or we can just stay above these waterfalls and treat it like a lake it's it's a really nice kind of outdoors area it's it's hunterdon county new jersey Mm. and um sounds charming yeah it is thank you that's a good (laughs) that's a good way to describe it yeah now So let me, I want to get back to kind of your, your, your weight gain yeah. growing up. So at what age did you know, start to notice or somebody comment that, hey, Anthony, you know, you're getting a little heavy? Yeah, it was between the fourth and fifth grades. So I guess that's probably between nine and nine and 10 years old. Um, what happened was I left North Carolina, um, you know, right after school ended in the fourth grade. And I got on the airplane and I went and spent the summer in New Jersey um, with my dad, my brother and I. And I came back to North Carolina and my friend, his name is Woody. And uh, when I... My name's not Harrelson, is it? No, Woody O'Dell. Uh And the the first time I saw saw Woody after I came back, he's like, wow, Anthony, he's like, you got fat over the summer. And he just said it like that. And it wasn't like he he wasn't even making fun of me. He was just observing, you know, like that's what, that's what happened. And um, I didn't realize it probably because it came on gradually over those three months that I was away. But people who hadn't seen me in a three month period of time, you know, when, when you don't see something, it, the change is a little bit more apparent. Yeah. So that's what happened. And the tricky part for me, I mean, this is going back now, you know, this is early 80s. This is probably 82, 83 or 84. And there weren't a lot of overweight people in, in my school, right? In fact, there were two in my, in my grade. It was me and, a, and one other kid. Yeah. And what that did was it kind of enabled me to identify as, as being overweight or as being the, the fat kid. And that was a little bit challenge That caused other kind of challenges where I would kind of even hold myself back or I would want to be reserved. And, and that lasted all the way to adulthood where I didn't want to put myself front and center mm. because I wasn't very confident in my with myself. And so that was from the age of, did you say like roughly? Probably 10 years old, fifth 10, grade, fifth 10 grade. until adulthood, adulthood being like. What? 33 is like when I decided to finally, to, when I, and I tried everything that, and anything that I could between ages 10 and 33, but age 33 is when I was finally able to actually start yeah. some, and we're some gonna, change. We're going to get to 33. Yeah. And well, how, and we got a little way to go. <laughs> um, so when you say you tried everything, like, can you remember how old you were when you first decided to try something? Well, I remember because of what houses we were in. So I was probably, this was, this had to be fifth grade. So, oh, this was fifth grade. I remember at some point giving up all, um, like fats, like butter, like butter and cheese and just trying to avoid that stuff. The problem is I never really knew what to eat. I, it yeah. was always about what to give up. So mm-hmm. there was a phase of giving up butter. And it and it helped me a little bit. But then I would still, and at this time I'm in North Carolina during the school year, so I would still get a biscuit, 
but I would get a biscuit with jelly on it instead of a biscuit with butter on it. Right. But now, meanwhile, I don't know how much butter is inside the baked into the biscuit already anyway, you sure. know? So, so I didn't know what I was doing and really no one knew how to help me. I mean, I did have, you know, overweight doctors at different points throughout my life telling me I needed to lose weight, but they couldn't really help me. They couldn't help themselves. Um, my mother was, uh, was, very act, was a very active person, and she was not overweight, so she didn't really have experience on, you know, that she could really how um, concerned share. Were, how concerned was she with you gaining weight and Mike kind of, you know, staying the same? I don't think very much. Um, and I think it was, I don't think it was as kind of front and center. Like, I don't think we understood really that it's, like it felt just like I looked different from him. Like it wasn't really about my health mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. Like it was just assumed we were both healthy, you know, back then. It wasn't like she had reason to be concerned other than the way I looked. And of course she loved me no matter how I looked. So sure. it was the kind of thing where she was supportive, but again, she wasn't like pushing me or motivating me or trying to do research to help to, to figure it out either. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is how Anthony is. This is how Mike is, you right. know, and they're both my kids. Right. So it wasn't like she took you to a doctor to do a analysis on your gut microbiome. No. And, uh, <laughs> and identify <laughs> different species that I need to build up or reduce. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. No, it was just my, like my regular physicals, my regular checkups. And the doctor would say, by the way, you should lose some weight. Yeah. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's not very helpful information. What, a, what about your dad? Did he observe yeah. it? Did he notice it? He did. And, and he would say the same thing. But you know what's interesting, Rip? And I just, I've been really paying attention to this more recently. I look back and my dad probably always carried an extra, you know, 10 to 20 pounds. And then I look back, my grandfather probably always carried an extra 10 to 20 pounds. And my grandfather was a produce man. He, he, he had a produce, um, um, he had the produce section of the supermarket in New wow. York. So it wasn't like a stand on the street, but it, it was his store within a store and, and produce. And growing at the, at the time that he did as, a, as an immigrant to the US, um, they didn't let anything spoil. Mm. So I know for sure that that man ate more than his share of fruits and vegetables, because if anything was turning or anything wasn't selling, that's what they were eating. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so how much, yeah. So, so I'm just like, how much of it as is I do, you know, is that I have the potential you have that to hold. That. Yeah, yeah. I have the potential. Now what I do in my lifestyle will help to see whether that turns on or, or turns off. Um, Whereas at least growing up, you know, I don't think that my brother had that potential. Right. We're just a little bit different. Well, and if, and if, you, if you both had maybe a little bit of that different, uh, let's just call it a, a heavy gene. Yeah. Right? And then you also are drawn to these foods. And then I'm around right? them and then you're for around 18 it. hours a yeah, day or a 20 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. It's a recipe for sure. For I mean, and, and I believe this. To, you know, I mean, we all are products of our situations. It's our environment, and then the decisions that we choose to make within that environment, and that's that's what. So that's so, how I grew up. So, can you remember how old you were when you broke two hundred pounds? Um, I remember I graduated high school at two hundred ninety pounds. Two hundred ninety. Two hundred ninety pounds. I graduated high school, so, and and I wasn't. I'm. I'm almost 6'4 now. I used to be a solid 6'4". And you weren't four. playing like offensive line, were you? I wasn't doing any sports at all. I mean, I was skateboarding after school. Or, or, and I was roller skating through 6th and 7th grade. You know, that was, that was a, a lot of fun back then. But, but I, so I was active, but I was never on a team. I never had a coach. I never had a, a trainer or someone that was kind of advising me on athletic performance or, you know, even playing games or anything like that. Mm. Um, but I remember someone, I, I, the only reason I remember this is because someone asked me, they said, they said, wow, Anthony, what are you weighing these days? And it wasn't even like I was, you know, I'm, I was also tall. How um, tall are you? Right now I'm probably, I'm just under six, four. Okay. At the time graduating high school, I was probably six, two or so, which was still enough to be taller than, than, um, most of the kids, um, that I was around, but I remember someone asked me and, and I said about 290 and that was right at, that was, I think at high school graduation. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know when I broke 200, yeah. but it, clearly before high school. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's incredible to me 
like all these guys that I swam with yeah. at University of Texas, and we all weighed, you know, really within 10 pounds of each other. We were all between 165 to maybe one, 185, 20 yeah. pounds. Yeah. And that was back when we were, you know, 19, 20, 21. And today, uh, a lot of these guys are 270 to 300. Wow. Right? Wow. And one of the things is, you know, you're, when you're training that hard, you're also consuming a lot of calories. Yeah. So you're, you're burning a lot of those calories. Yeah. And you, but you build up this appetite that is, it, it's hard to, to moderate. Yeah, it works in balance when you've got the activity level to match it. Exactly. And it, as soon as you turn one up or down, then it's not balanced anymore, yep. right? Yeah. But I, I, I say that because there's probably a lot of people that are listening yeah. to the podcast right now that have, since high school, they've probably put on a good yeah. 50 to 100 pounds. And they're probably sitting here wondering, like, how in the world did that happen? You know, it, it's 20 years later now, and... I'm I'm 80 pounds heavier than I was when I graduated from high school. Right. And and even probably non-athletes, I mean, back 20 years ago, we were probably much more active. You know, maybe we didn't have sit-down jobs at the time or maybe we were playing with our friends after school or maybe we had to ride our bike, you know, a half hour to get to someone's house or some, you know, all of those things count, yep, right? Yep. As activity. And then as soon as you take that away, again, it still messes with that balance a little bit. So you say 290 when you graduated from high school. Yes. Do you remember at all, like, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade? Did you have a scale? Were you ever measuring yourself, or was that something you stayed away from? No, I, I mean, I probably occasionally, I think there was probably one on the floor in my mom's bathroom that I would step on occasionally. But it was mostly, you know, when we went for, like, an annual physical, like an annual checkup at the doctor um, is, when, is when I would get on the scale. Yeah. Yeah. And so are you are you getting more and more concerned because obviously as a high schooler yeah that, that's 290 you're not playing football so it's not you're not supposed to be you know right. big and intimidating right. you're just you're just big it sounds like because obviously you got the gene and you also you're surrounded and you love uh, yeah. all of the pleasure trap foods yeah yeah right yeah so I think what was happening to me more, I wasn't, again, I wasn't concerned about health. I was concerned about cosmetics, right? Like how I looked and how I felt like I presented myself. By this time, I'm not shopping for clothes where my friends are shopping for clothes. And even when I was like, you know, into stuff, like I couldn't go to go buy, you know, if, if there was a cool t-shirt, like Ocean Pacific t-shirts or oh. stuff like that, right? Like, you know, like I outsized that stuff. They didn't make that stuff in extra, extra, you know, double extra large or triple extra large or any of those sizes back then. So I would wear the extra large, but it wasn't ever comfortable. And um, not, you know, being overweight and then wearing clothes that are uncomfortable and probably even more unflattering, like really zapped my confidence, mm. you know, and it, and it, and it, yeah, that's so give, where I say it affected how I presented myself. Can you give me some examples of how it affected your confidence? Yeah, like, um, well, I, we mentioned roller skating. Roller skating was a big deal for me um, in in probably early high school, um, maybe freshman year, but definitely in, in middle school, sixth, let's, let's say seventh, eighth, maybe ninth grade, roller skating, Friday night and Saturday night, right? And then they had different things. Like they had the roll the dice, they had the speed skate, and then they had couple skates. Mm -hmm. Like, I would never ask someone to, to couple skate. Were you a good and skater? I was a good skater. So I wasn't going to fall down. Right. right. So you had some skating chops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a little bit of, I still have some. We still go once in a while. Oh, nice. <laughs> but, um, um, but I remember once a girl asked me to couple skate. And I kind of looked around. <laughs> like, I thought it was a joke. Like, if it was today, I would think that someone's videoing in the background and that here I am, I'm going to get out on the floor. She's going to let go of my hands, skate away, and I'm going to be out there all by myself. You're going to punk you. So you know what happened? So I said no. And looking back on that, that that's like I don't feel good about that, Rip, because here someone else got up the confidence to ask me to skate with them. Yeah. And she was a very pretty girl. And, and I said no. And like how might that have made her even feel, right? Like, and, and I don't know if she was just was doing it for 
to be friendly or for right. any, but for there was no scenario in the world that I should have, that I would feel proud for saying no, right, to, to that request. Yeah. And, and, and that is, I think that's a perfect example of how I just, it was just always in the front of my mind, whatever was going on. Do you remember what her name was? I do. And have you ever reached back out to her? To, I haven't. To say, you know, I really wish I would have said yes. You think I should? I do you think, think she I, even remembers? I, Maybe. You know what? I think it's worth it. Yeah. I think it's worth it to find out. I'll follow out. up with and you, you on that. No. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. So, any, any, I mean, okay, that's a great example. Yeah. Any other examples? Well, fast forward. Yeah, this is yeah. a little bit later. Um, my wife and I are living in New Jersey. We have a house with a lot of property, and my friend's getting married. Right. So, but wait, wait, wait. Yeah, that's a big step no, no, here because no, this okay. is it's the same oh, context. Okay, 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 We're not okay. going too far. Okay. Um, so he was getting married in my yard. So we set up a tent and you know, and mowed the yard and everything. We had it all set up. It was beautiful. Um, his fiance, the bride's parents, wanted to set off fireworks. So they came over and they brought us a case of champagne and a note, a really nice note. And they say, "Will you please bring this around to all of your neighbors?" and give everyone a bottle of champagne and give them this note, really so they didn't call the cops. Yeah. But the note said, celebrate with us, you know? So we wanted to bring around this champagne and this note to all of our neighbors to let them know, hey, we were having a big party. We were kind of new to the neighborhood. We didn't already know the neighbors really. And we didn't want anyone to call the police or we didn't want to, we didn't want to ruin anyone else's night because we wanted to celebrate, but they really wanted to set off these fireworks at, after their, at their wedding. And here I am now, six foot four, probably 350, 360 pounds. I didn't want to go knock on a stranger's door. Right. Right? Because, like, and so I bring my wife, who you've met, and she's all of about five two. Yeah. Uh, maybe five one and a half. You know, she, she's, um, you know, she's in, in good shape. And I, would, I, I wouldn't go to the neighbor's houses without her because I wanted her to stand in front of me because I didn't want just this big kind of whatever you know, a uh, giant person who, who didn't, I didn't feel very presentable to be knocking on people's doors to try to explain that we were having this wedding. I mean, together it was just easy. We, you know, we moved in next door. So like that, that's a little more recent yeah. example, but yeah. that those kind of, that's just kind of how the mind, my mind was working. So help me move through yeah. like you're, you're 350, 360 yeah. pounds. What's it like moving through your day? Yeah. Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, going grocery shopping, getting in elevators, yeah. uh, you know, your coworkers, uh, are you, are you, is it something that you're constantly thinking about or is it something that after a certain period of time you're, you're, you're able to just like shut I down? I mean, it, it's, it wasn't always painful, right? So, so yeah. like, but it's always there. For example, right now I'm sitting in an armchair. And you're sitting in, a, in an open chair with no arms, yeah. right? Whenever I went into a meeting at work, I would always have to get there early and I would scan the rooms to see which chairs don't have arms in them because I literally did not fit in an armchair. Oh, because you'd squeak. Yeah, I was too wide. And if there were only armchairs, I would try to find a chair in another room and bring it in there. You know, sometimes they had stacks of chairs in the corner for like overflow, right? They had the regular... but, But... Like, so I just was that these things were automatic to me, Rip. Like I had to make sure because I, I couldn't go sit in a room for two hours in pain because I could fit in an armchair, but I had to basically sit, hover above the arms and push to squeeze myself in between them. My legs were smashed together like sideways. And I sat there. I don't want to say painful. It was painful probably at times, but uncomfortable yeah. for the entire time. Same thing happened on an airplane. You, you know, I, w I would travel for work and um, I would be w flying by myself and I'm walking down the aisle um, and I just feel all eyes on me in, if, with everyone who has an empty seat next to them. And as soon as I pass, I almost sense like a sigh of relief, right? So like there are those kind of little things, you know, I, I would have to order all of my clothes. I couldn't just go into the store and try things on. You know, they probably didn't really fit properly anyway because it's a different shaped body than what they're really designing clothes for. Where would you order your clothes from? It, well, big and big and tall. It was casual mall, casual male, big and tall back then. Now I think it's called like casual male XL. I mean, I'm, 
I'm very grateful I'm not shopping there anymore, but, but that's the reason I was able to have clothes, um, you know, uh, in those kind of, you know, in those late teens to, to, um, through my twenties. So, so there were all of those kind of little reminders that were just always around. When, uh, so you went to college? Yes. Right. Yeah. Where, went, where'd you go to school? I went to a community college in New Jersey. Um, I stay, live with my dad, and I did that for a few years, and then I finished up at the University of Baltimore in Baltimore City in Maryland. And what did you get your degree in? Uh, it was a combination of computer science and business. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was fun. I loved the computer stuff. I was fascinated by the, by the business, and I, was, and I went to that school specifically because they had a very tech-enabled business center that, that the state of Maryland just... Um, gave them a big grant to put in place, and it was a fascinating place to finish my education. So the entrepreneurial gene runs through yeah. the, your family a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's it called? Bagel Barn? No, Bagel Smith. Bagel Smith. <laughs> Bagel Smith. Yeah. Here, here in Austin, we have a. Well, I mean, that might be worldwide. It's called Golf Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen those stores. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Same idea. All right. So, what was your first job uh, out of? Out of college. So, well, I worked at the I worked at the Bagel Smith until it shut down. I mean, I could never get away from that. My first job out of college, though, I got I got really lucky looking back, um, was at the National Institutes of Health, working on the Human Genome Project. Wow! And what year was that? That was in 1996 or 1997. Wow. 90, yeah, 96, 97, right in there. And what happened was I was graduating college but at the University of Baltimore. So they had this incredible infrastructure in this building that I, that I was serious. When I said the state of Maryland, they got a huge grant to build like this most tech-enabled building that, that you can imagine, yeah. which probably would just feel normal today. But that's, what, 30 years later or right, so, right? right? So... Um, but what happened was the courses were all still the same. So my friends and I, my school friends and I would just spend all our time in the computer labs and we taught ourselves how to do internet programming and not, not building websites, but building websites that could talk to databases Mm. and, and web applications and web tools. And we knew how to do that. We learned how to do that in, you know, like 96, 97 where it wasn't really a thing. Like there were no programs you could go to for school for that. We, we in fact, we did, um, we put together, I guess it's like a petition or something to bring in an instructor to teach us the Java programming language. And that, that instructor had to come from Sun Microsystems, the company that invented Java. Mm-hmm. So, so we, were, we were just into it. We had no idea what the web was gonna become or the internet, but we learned how to do programming. And one of my friends went and got a job at NIH and. And they almost, they were just thrilled that someone knew how to do what they wanted to do. Right. Didn't matter that he didn't know anything about biology or genetics or genomics or, or any of that. Because he wow. could do the, and they, he, and they needed people. Yeah. So we went to lunch one day and he's like, he's like, hey, we need people. Does anybody else want to come work with me? And I was like, I'll go. You know, and, and um, I went down there and that was a fascinating place to work. Mm. It was um that's where I learned that people are passionate about their careers. I mean, my father enjoyed his business, but he was selling bagels to, to make a living. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, selling bagels and sandwich and convenience items. My mother was selling Mary Kay cosmetics, but she was doing the same thing. She was doing it to, you know, to make a living. And here I am at NIH working with these scientists who are really dedicating their careers to advancing the body of knowledge related to genetics, Mm. like by this much on a relative scale. You know, like their whole career, they might only figure out like one iteration of how this is going to help humanity over time. And maybe the next generation of scientists is going to take it one or two iterations further. And then maybe a generation, two or three generations later, these guys, this is now going to solve big, pro- big, big, you know, big world issues or big, yeah. you know, so I, w- that was fascinating to me to be around people like that. I mean, I felt like the, like the luckiest person in the world. So they're just, they're just passionate and happy to be contributing to what in the long term will be some pretty monumental gains Yeah, in, in understanding whatever it is. And we didn't know. I mean, I stayed there through the completion of the sequencing of the human genome. And we had celebrations like, oh, we've sequenced a billion base pairs. Now we sequence two billion base pairs. Like we would go into DC and we would have these big parties at like the Smithsonian Institute to celebrate these milestones. And, um, wow. and it was fascinating. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was cool. 
Okay. So uh, what after like so what was yep. your first job after So so then that. my <laughs> wife said so, well, so so I was married now. So so I, yeah. I we need, we yeah. need to rewind okay. a little bit cuz I want to understand when you met your wife if you're you know, if you're being heavy and overweight yeah. was an obstacle or if it didn't play in at all. And how'd you, how'd you guys meet all yeah, that stuff? So we met just through mutual friends in New Jersey. She's from the town that my dad lived in. Mm -hmm. And I had mutual friends from being back and forth every summer. And I didn't meet her until she was graduating high school, but just happened to be, you know, around mutual friends and met her. And then we just were in the same friends group. And that was probably for about four or five years. We weren't, we weren't dating at and the time. And had you dated much before this? No, I had one girlfriend for maybe a year or so. Um, and then one like kind of short, you know, short term girlfriend, but, but not, I mean, dating wasn't a big part of my yeah. life because again, you yeah. know, as I've shared, you know, like I wasn't sure it had like, I had to have a, a you know, a girl who had the courage to come up to me yeah. almost, yeah. you know, uh -huh. it was a little different with Kathy. I ended up chasing her for about I don't know if it took me a year. I had to be very persistent. <laughs> with, you mean to because, get her to go out on a yeah, date? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. we were already friends, and and that wasn't good enough for me. I got to a point where that wasn't good enough for me, and um, you know, involved some letter writing and some and some. Um, you know, I had to be ready to almost kind of jeopardize the friendship, but by trying to pursue you know, uh, you well, know, romantic relationship. Which, sounds like it worked out. Yeah. Cause I wouldn't stop. <laughs> and, and yeah. I was big at, I was as big as ever at the time, you know, yeah. um, I got back down to about two ninety, I think when I was living in Baltimore. But then as soon as I started working full time, it, it all just came, it came right back. So when you say you like with, uh, with Kathy, yeah, you just, you knew what you wanted, you, yeah. you know, you just, there was something about her yeah. and, uh, she was you just, you wouldn't. And we were like best friends at this point. She went to school at temple in Philadelphia and at the time, the Amtrak train was 20 bucks to go back and forth between Philadelphia and Baltimore. And neither of us had a ton going on on the weekends. And other, other friends were in different areas or back in New Jersey, which was hard to get to because neither of us had a car. So we ended up hanging out, out a lot either in Philadelphia or in Baltimore because it was like a one hour, maybe an hour and a half train ride and 20 bucks. You literally just jumped on the train. Eventually, the conductor came and took your money and <laughs> you get off in Philadelphia. So yeah. Um, so we were, and that was before we were even dating. We were, we were still hanging out like that. So it just made sense. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that <clears throat> she intuitively sensed that you wanted more than a friendship? I was pretty, uh, maybe, but um, I, by the time I sensed it, like it really, I felt it at one time. I was like, wait, you know, we should be, you know, because... She also, she had, um, you know, she had a boyfriend or two at the time and we were all mm -hmm. friends, you know, like, yeah. you know, so it was like, it wasn't like it was just the two of us and I was like kind of, you know, creeping on her or something like that. It was like, you know, it just made sense for us to be friends. And then at one point I was like, wait, it makes sense for us to be more than friends. And that, that, you know, I had to convince her a little bit. <laughs> but that's good. So, so you made yeah. it clear to her, her clear yeah. to her that you wanted more and right. she didn't run away she basically just uh was patient and you had to convince well, her. well it was like we had to evaluate this and figure it out and and she wasn't sure at first and then and then eventually she caved we'll call it caved and uh, and we started dating it's been a lot of fun ever since yeah and so you when you said like you just would not stop is that indicative of your personality in other areas yes yeah yeah i can be persistent uh-huh uh-huh <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, yeah. I'm a big fan of that quality, yeah. that characteristic. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I do get I do get kind of focused and I figure out how to how to make things work. Right. And that's what it was. And and make things work not <clears throat> in a force not in a forceful way, but how can we really make things kind of fall into place? Yeah. And that cuz that's what it that's what it felt like. It felt like things finally just fell into place. All right. So let let's go back to you in the very beginning of this conversation said that when you were like nine or 10, you basically started gaining the weight up until 33. So when, how old were you when you got married to Kathy? Can you remember? I was, I was 28. Okay. Yeah. 28. It was so, in 2000. So what happened at the age of 33 that all of a sudden, you know, uh, allowed something to click in your, in your brain? Yeah. Um, we had a child. 
my first son, Evan, he was born. She was pregnant with our second son, Henry. Wow. And I went for a life insurance policy, a 20 year term life insurance policy. And I went for another policy. I had, I had had life insurance, like a smaller policy, you know, um, when we were just married and we, before we had kids and, and it was enough insurance. But now I was being advised that now that I have two kids, I have a mortgage, like I want to be able to take care of, if something happens to me, I need to be able to take care of them. So I applied for an additional 20 year term life insurance policy and I was denied. And I was concerned about being in a high risk category. Mm. The idea of being denied never crossed my mind. But when I read that letter, um, I knew what that meant. And what that meant was they plugged in all my medical records. They plugged in my current state of health and their algorithm didn't expect me to live for 20 years. And it scared me. So, yeah. But up until this point, are you, are you on any med medications? Have you been in, in and out of the hospital much? Like, did your medical records... Was there something in there? Yeah. That, that, well, well, that's what, so it was, it was a, a combination of everything. So I had not been in and out of the hospital at all. And I think that would have scared me also. Yeah. I was on medication for high blood pressure. Um, it was roughly controlled. I think my doctor was okay that we had it down to like 140 over 90 um, on two medications. Yeah. So that was high. I had, even through college, I always donated blood. And I would say half the time, maybe a little bit more, I would get a letter from them saying they weren't able to use my blood. Why? Because there, something in the chemistry was out of whack. And they didn't give me detail, but they suggested I go see a doctor. But I, I didn't go see the doctor. I would just wait till the next time I could donate blood and see if it got any different, right? right? right. But so I wasn't, I wasn't shocked. But anyway, so they always told me my blood pressure was a little bit high. I was always told my cholesterol was a little bit high. Um, so by this time now, before the life insurance policy, I was on two medications for blood pressure. My cholesterol was about 220 or so, which was just enough where I could kind of convince them that I was gonna do something about it. I didn't really have to go on medications. Because when they talk about these medications, they said, once you start, that's it, you're on, you're on it forever. And that scared me, I didn't, I didn't wanna do that. Um, I had eczema on my fingers where the, the fronts of my fingers would crack and peel and bleed. I had psoriasis behind my neck where the skin would get flaky and it would be almost like an open sore sometimes. Yeah. Um, I was recently diagnosed with sleep apnea. Um, Does that I, mean, were you having to wear the CPAP? Or? See, everything I did, Rip, I'm like, I don't want to wear that machine yeah. at, at night. They sent me for a sleep study and it was easy for me to dismiss the sleep study because I'm sleeping in this room in the hospital with cameras on me with wires connected all over my, you know, all over my body and, and, um, and my head, all these things taped to me. I'm like, you can't judge my night's sleep <laughs> on this one, this yeah. one night, you know? And so, so I dismissed it. So I didn't want the CPAP machine, you know, all, all of those, all those things. And, um, I would get migraine headaches and I had a prescription for, a, for a medication that would help with migraine headaches that I think I was supposed to take all the time to prevent them, but I would just try to take it when I got them, but it didn't, yeah. it didn't really help. So I think, and then by this time I weighed 360 pounds, I had a 54 inch waist and I have all these health complications. Now, now any one of these things I could talk to one friend about because I had other friends with high cholesterol. I had other friends with high blood pressure. I had other friends who were overweight, but I guess this whole, my understanding is this whole package didn't give me a good outcome. My, my liver enzymes were always high. My triglycerides were always off the chart. Yep, yep. You know, all, all this stuff. I, w I wasn't healthy. Let me, I just, I just want to ask you before we continue yeah. is so you're 360 pounds, 33, you've got a, a child, you got one on the way, you've been married for about four years four, at that point. Four years. What does a typical day of eating look like for you? I mean, was it, I mean, yeah. I, I'd love to understand what that looks like. Yeah, and this is, this is hard because it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think, right? So I wouldn't have anything for breakfast. Um, or if I did, I would have coffee, sometimes black coffee, sometimes coffee with cream and sugar, mm -hmm. right? 
and I, w- I wouldn't eat breakfast. And then for lunch, it would be like two slices of pizza. This is where it gets like a little bit um, where obvious, more obvious. Like on my way home from work, if I was hungry, you know, sometimes I would pull in, get a cold slice of pizza and eat it on the, in the car on the way home. But it would literally be one slice of, you know, New York style, uh, New York style pizza. Where I got into complications was when there was a birthday celebration at work and they were serving cake or if someone brought in cookies and put them into the break room, like that kind of stuff. When there's food around that's out, like I'll eat it and I won't even really be paying attention. I'll, I'll just keep eating it. Then dinner at, at home was not too bad. I mean, there were times like where we would get like, um, you know, the equivalent of like a Papa John's pizza with the garlic butter sauce. And I would eat, put that on it and eat it. But I wasn't eating fast food. Like I wasn't driving through McDonald's or Burger King, you know, things like that. We were members of a CSA farm and we were committed to eating all of the vegetables. So we ended up cooking that stuff. I mean, I was absolute. I was 360 pounds. Oh, I should I had. I was a vegetarian. So I wasn't eating meat, but I was eating cheese and eggs and dairy. Um, and for how, for how long have you been a vegetarian? 1994. So, yeah, when, when I went vegetarian in 1994, it was one of, my, one of my attempts to get healthy. I gave up alcohol and meat on the same day. Hmm. It was January 24th, 1994. And I haven't had meat or alcohol since. And, and I got healthy, Rip, because in 1994, to be vegetarian, all I knew was to go to the produce aisle and get rice, and I bought a wok. And I would just cook vegetables and rice. And I would use oil, different kind of oils to get them really hot in the wok, whatever, peanut oil. But, like, it wasn't in comparison. But then slowly, vegetarian to me became cheese pizza or, or you know, vegetable stuffed pizza, with had, which had top and the bottom. Or pizza with the garlic butter sauce on it. Like, that was vegetarian. Or cheese omelets. Or my go-to, no matter where I was, if I needed to eat, was a grilled cheese sandwich, mm. which is white bread, butter, and cheese you know sometimes i get a slice of tomato on it like you know big deal and usually with a order of french fries so there was that kind of stuff but then in the evening like it could be a whole pint of ben and jerry's ice cream you know and and a i pint or a half gallon or no a pint just because the ben and jerry's came in the pint yes. right i think what, it's a what, pint. Was, what was your flavor contain. of choice do you know? well chubby hubby <laughs> Because I didn't, I didn't have to share that one, Rip. Because I told Kathy she already had a chubby hubby. She didn't need any of this ice cream. Well, it, <laughs> it, it, it was your signature ice cream then. Chubby hubby. I mean, it's chocolate-covered, peanut butter-filled pretzels yeah. in a mixture of peanut butter ice cream with chocolate swirl. Like, it's like that's like made for me. <laughs> yeah, that's making my mouth water right now. Sorry. Gosh. <laughs> Probably with disgust. <laughs> Well, it's yeah. actually it's actually not because yeah. everything about that sounds so good. Right. I mean, they had the salt in there, and yeah. the you know, I remember. Obviously, I remember it. But that that was a that was a challenging part. And when I was traveling a lot back and forth, I would travel. Used to travel to Boston for for work at the time. Um, that at this time now, I was working at Novartis Pharmaceuticals. Okay. And and the hotel was connected to a grocery store, so I didn't even have to go out to eat. You know, I could just go to the grocery, like, or even if we went out to eat, if I didn't get dessert and I wanted to, when I came back to the hotel, I could literally go over there to the freezer section and, and I can't save half a pint of ice cream when I get it there. I had to eat the whole container because yeah. I didn't have a freezer. Yeah. And you're not going to waste any no. ice cream. So, so when I say it wasn't too bad, there was too much dessert stuff. There was, I would overeat when I was in an environment where there was food around, but I was also eating, you know, vegetables and I wasn't eating meat and I wasn't drinking alcohol. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is, you know, I've had other guests on, on the show, like Adam Sud, yeah. Chuck Carroll, yeah. uh, Ken Lander. And, I mean, these guys, like fast food junkies. Like multiple times a day. Multiple times a day. Cars covered, Adam's apartment uh, covered with, right? Yeah, the, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's egregious how much time they spent, how much money they spent at fast food restaurants. And that doesn't sound like it was the case. It wasn't me because I was 360 pounds and I could not wait for fresh asparagus season to come in the spring. And I would make egg white or, or, or asparagus omelets with either egg whites or with, with whole eggs. But like that fresh asparagus, like that's still, that's, I mean that, that I look forward to that every single year, like still. And does the asparagus make your urine smell? Yes, it does. It does. Okay, so you've got that <laughs> so gene too. I've got too. that gene too. All right. I'm I hear blessed it, with all the good ones. I've heard it affects 50% of yeah. uh, 
of people. All right, can we, let's let's come yeah. back to 33. You got denied yeah. at with your 20 20 year yeah. term life insurance, and your jaw kind of hit the ground. Yeah, that 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 was a 20 year death sentence to me. Like yeah. that means you're not going to make it 20 years. Yeah. You're you might, but they don't tell you if that means five years or 15 years or whatever, right? It's just not 20. So. To me, that means I'm not going to see my kids graduate high school. Yeah. You know, my, my Henry wasn't born yet. Yeah. You know, and, and I wasn't going to see these kids grow up. And, and then, so I thought about that and it scared me. But the best thing that happened from, from that denial le- uh, letter is it forced me to take a really objective look at what my life was really like. Mm. And when I did that, I wasn't, I wasn't happy with it because not only was I not going to be there, but I started to imagine what is life going to be like in this state leading up to whatever might or might not happen, right? Like, am I going to be having any fun? Am I going to be an active part of these kids' lives? Yeah. Am I going to be someone who's just on the sidelines all the time? I mean, and so how concerned was, uh, was your wife, Kathy with, you know, you at 360, you've got one child, you got one child on the way, and you're denied. Is, is this something, are you sharing your feelings with her or, or not? Yeah, but she's an incredibly supportive person. Uh-huh. And she's not as long-sighted as I am. So she wanted me to always feel okay in the moment. So she was always very comforting. She was always very supportive in those ways, uh-huh. but not like we have to do something about this. It's like, it was more like, whatever you feel it's okay whatever you want to do i'll support you you know let we like things like that but not like hey we should use this as a wake-up call to to you know to do something differently that all came from like that was kind of brewing inside of me and you think that kathy looking back just was was doing the best that she could she's and, very accepting she's a yeah. very accepting person she i i really believe in a very sincere place that she didn't feel like she needed to change me and uh-huh. she probably didn't think long enough ahead to think of how it might have affected her mm-hmm. you know she's like we're we're gonna be fine you know yeah. it, was, it was that kind of tone well this is yeah this is fascinating yeah so um all right so yeah what so, happened so so there's one there's one instance that, that kind of sums it up for me. And it was really my, it's the moment that I still go to when I need to. And, and, and me and Kathy, she's pregnant now with Henry. And we have 18-month-old Henry. I mean, 18-month-old Evan. And we go to the local church carnival comes to town, right? And already we talked about I don't fit on an airplane. So there's no way I don't, I don't fit on the rides at, at the carnival. But my kid's 18 months old. And, you know, 18 months old, you can kind of tell that there's a person in there and they, they have things that they excite them and things that make them upset. So we were thrilled as new parents. Like, I always wanted to be a dad. Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't wait for this, right? So we're, go, we're at the church carnival and I'm holding Evan and, and we're walking with Kathy and, uh, you know, there's lights and bells and noises and all this exciting stuff going on. And he's just kind of fascinated with all of it. And we turn a corner and there was a train like a kiddie train ride that went around just in a small oval and he starts squirming and pointing and he was probably saying like thomas or something because he had thomas the train toys at home and all this stuff realizing now that he this is probably the first time he ever saw a train that he could actually fit on we didn't have trains around where we you know where i lived in new jersey that he would see maybe he thought trains were toys but now that he saw one that he could ride right so we were excited that he was excited and we go to, we, so we walk over to take him on the train ride. And just as naturally as could be, Rip, I hook my thumbs under his armpits, you know, to take him from my chest to hint him to Kathy so they can go on the ride. And he, he wouldn't let go of my shirt, mm. you know. And I thought, oh, he wants me to take him on the train. But there's no way that's happening. This isn't an adult size ride. This is made for kids. Um, even though Kathy was very pregnant at the time, like she was his best chance of getting on the train. They weren't letting him go on at 18 months by himself. So we go to the attendant. Uh, we give the tickets. I'm just grinning ear to ear. He's with Kathy now. He probably doesn't even remember I exist because they're walking towards this train. The two of them get on and I'm just sitting there smiling. And the attendant kind of like wakes me up a little bit and says, excuse me, sir, you just have to stand over here. Cause I was probably blocking whoever was trying to get on the train next, right? So I move over and I stand and I'm literally standing behind a metal gate. 
And while I'm standing there, I'm watching them as they're going just around in circles and they're laughing and they're having a great time. And, you know, maybe they wave at me sometimes when they see me, but they're doing their thing, right? And two questions popped into my mind. Number one, is this the kind of father I'm going to be? And number two, is this the kind of husband that I'm going to be for Kathy? What else am I not going to be able to participate in? What else am I, is she going to have to do as uncomfortable as she may feel because I'm just physically unable? And, and I didn't like the answer to either of those questions because the answer was yes. That is the kind of husband I was going to be. And that is the kind of father I was going to be. And, um, yeah, that was unacceptable. Mm-hmm. That, had, that was a problem that had to be solved. Okay, so, so, so that was a uh, defining moment. Yeah, and, and I didn't realize it as much in the moment, but then I get the life insurance policy and all these things kind of come afterwards, and, and it all just kind of came crashing down to me, and that was it. I, I had to do something very different. I had to make a big change, and I had to figure this out. Yeah. This was no longer optional. All right, so what did you do? So I set a New Year's resolution. We were, we were in October or so, or November, uh, this is at 2005, and I said in 2006, I'm giving up sweets, I'm giving up soda, and I'm going to figure out how to lose 50 pounds in the year of 2006. Those were my those were my goals. That was it, and I I didn't know what to do other than to keep myself hungry and not eat sweets and soda. So still, I haven't had sweets or soda you know to this day wow. yeah, since. I mean, now I have like delicious date sweetened desserts and stuff like that. But I even, you know, I, I draw a dotted line in maple syrup. Even if there's maple syrup, sometimes I will, sometimes I won't. But that one, like I'm always, I'm even cautious with things that are that, that sweet, right? But, but um, I did that for three months and I didn't lose a single pound. Hmm. I was hungry all the time. I was, and I wasn't losing weight. And everything that was out there when I, when I was looking for how to lose weight was all at Adkins. This is, you know, again, this is 2005, 2006. Yeah. And I wasn't, I didn't want to start eating meat. You know, I was already vegetarian. I was proud of the fact that I was vegetarian. I felt so much better when I first went vegetarian. Yeah. So, so I started Googling vegetarian weight loss. And Dr. Furman's book, Eat to Live, pops up on Amazon.com. Yeah. And on the cover of that book, it says fast and sustained weight loss. I was like, that sounds pretty good. I was almost ready to sign up right there. Right. But then I read the comments on Amazon and what the reviews, what people were saying about it. And almost no one was talking about losing weight. Everyone was talking about getting healthy. Mm -hmm. And everyone was talking about getting off medications. And everyone was talking about feeling better. And everyone was talking about how much energy... And that was another moment that hit me. I didn't want to lose weight. Mm. I wanted to be healthy. Like, I never really associated the two. I always thought of my weight as something that was uh, visual, right, or physical. But I never. But now I said, oh, I can change the way I eat and I can become healthy? Mm-hmm. Like, that was that was new kind of thought to me. So I bought the book. I started doing exactly what it said. As I was reading it, I started making changes. And... Um, Kathy did not, you know, she continued doing what she, you know, this was very much my problem to solve. So I was reading this book. I was doing it. She was again, incredibly supportive. So did when you, did we, you consider yourself a bit of a chef? Were you, were, I always were loved you, to cook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so that wasn't hard. And also, so the first thing I did was I started eating breakfast, mm-hmm. but I would have fruit. Gotcha. That's it. Literally just fruit. Because I knew my take home message from when I started reading that book was eat more vegetables, eat more fruits, eat plenty of beans, some nuts and seeds, and almost nothing else. And lots of greens, green yeah. leafies. Yeah. Yeah. So I just lumped all of that into the vegetable. And I said, every day I'm going to try to eat more vegetables and more fruit than I did the day before. So here I am having nothing for breakfast. And I remember walking to the cafeteria at work. The cafeteria had fruit cut up every day. All you had to do was put it in a container and weigh it. Yeah. Like, like that was, the, how much easier does it get than that? I was walking with my friend Mike to the cafeteria and I said, I read this book that basically said the more fruits and vegetables you eat, the healthier you'll be. And you know what he said to me? He said, duh. And I'm like, well, why is this new to me? 
You know, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny. He really, really did. I was like, okay. So I, so I would get a pound or more of fruit for breakfast every day. Yeah. And then at lunch, I wouldn't eat anything else until I had a huge salad. And then, and we also had a beautiful salad bar in the cafeteria at work. So I could just load it up and make, make my salad with chickpeas on top of it or black beans on top of it, whatever they had there. Salsa, like just load up a big salad. And, and Are you having big. to pay for this or yeah. did employees no, eat for No, I had to pay free? for it. Okay. Yeah. No, I had to, I had to pay for it. It was probably subsidized, but it, yeah. but it was, you know, it wasn't any much more than I would be spending to, to eat anywhere else. So, yeah. so cost didn't really play into it. And um, I just started eating tons of fruits and vegetables. Three months after I bought the book, we brought Henry home. Henry was born. We came home from the hospital. And oh, I'm sorry, two months. And in those two months, I lost 30 pounds. And pretty much that put me on autopilot. I was like, so you, wow. You were just following This that, works. That like, protocol. that's it. Like, I don't need to learn another thing. Yeah. I just need to do it. And have you, um, have you ever met Joel? Yes. Furman? Yeah. yeah. So it turns out after I read the whole book and started losing weight, I read the back cover. He's New Jersey. He practiced family medicine about less than 10 miles from my house. Wow. Like that's about 15 minute drive from where we were. But um, I'm a kind of a cautious person with things. I never reached out to him. And I, I did it. I lost. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I did it. I completed it. The short version of the story is I got off all my medications in about two or three months. I lost 160 pounds in 20 months. Um, 20 and, months. and it felt wow. like it felt like nothing. Right. But but it was almost eight pounds a month every month, you know, for, for 20 months. Then I um, wrote up my I waited a year after I kept the, to make sure I was going to maintain the weight loss. And I wrote up my success story and I emailed it to their office. Yeah. They put me on the website. Then they would write to me and they would say, hey, can we use your story in, in uh, this appearance or this you know, yeah. presentation? Or can we put your story in the next version of Eat to Live, the next mm -hmm. edition that came out? I was very proud of that one. I said, yes, I signed all these things and sent them right back. Then I was picking my son up from the gym at, uh, at, from gymnastics one day. Yeah. And I was walking up the stairs and Joel Furman was right next to me on the stairs. Oh. And I looked over at him and never his, met him in person. This is like, this, my, my story is already in the book by this point. Um, I think he was working out at the gym. It was one, oh, okay. one of those huge mega gyms. And um, I said, are you Dr. Furman? And he goes, yeah, who are you? I said, my name's Anthony. I'm one of the success stories in your book. Because this is like years later. Yeah. And, he, and his jaw dropped. And then, and then he said, do you work out here? And I did sometimes, but I just, I, yeah. I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know what to say. I said, no, I'm just picking my son up at gymnastics. And I said, well, it was nice to meet you. And I walked away and that was it. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he must have registered that I was local because then the, then the emails I would get would say, hey, can you come share your story at this event I'm doing? You right. know, those, and then we became friends over, over years after that. Got it. Got yeah. It. Nice. Um, well, he's, he's, he's definitely got a pretty, uh, pretty tried and true method there with, you know, yeah. the... Uh, really pushing the fruits and the vegetables. He's not so much a fan of some of the, you know, the more start the, the starches, yeah. um, like McDougal. Right. Um, but uh, he, man, huge congrats! Thank you. It's huge. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. so, so my life completely changed in that twenty months. Um, I became more physically active than I ever had before. I started running for fun. That's something I never even crossed my mind. Huge. Yeah. Um, I was now proud of myself again for the first time in my life. I would walk in. I didn't have to go find the, the, the armless chairs in the room anymore. I could sit anywhere and be comfortable. I could stroll right down the aisle of the plane and sit down in the seat with extra room on either side. And I could use my seat belt. Um, I could play with, you know, going on a little bit later, I could play with my kids the way that they would want me to play with them. When we shoot basketball in the driveway and the ball goes rolling off the driveway, like I don't like sit there and huff and puff and wait for them to go get it. Like I would, I was racing them for it. And then they're trying to push me down in the grass and, you know, like basically it just the most beautiful, yeah. you know, kind of life that I could have ever imagined. Um, train, train rides? Ever, ever go on that train? I did. I have pictures of me back on the train rides with both kids, probably about two years later, on the exact same train. Um, will you do me a favor? Yeah. You need to send me those photos, and we can, we can put it in the show notes yeah, of the episode. For sure. That, that'd be awesome. Yeah. What about um, <clears throat> um, life insurance? 
Yeah. So I applied immediately. I applied less than two years after being denied. And I just wanted to get it on record that, that now I was healthy. And I never expected to get insured. But they actually issued me the policy yeah. in the premier preferred category or whatever, which means I almost don't even have to pay for it. And, it, you know, it's like so it's so I was in a less expensive category or their least expensive category ever, which probably means now I don't need it anymore. But um, I was surprised that they gave it to me right away. Mm. But again, I think that the you know, by following this whole food plant based diet and a, and a healthy lifestyle, everything was working. So anything that was ever a risk factor went from being like in the danger zone to being not just okay, but it went to being ideal. And I guess that was enough to convince at least the algorithm. It was the exact same insurance company. You know, I'm sure they had their history, you know, but um, yeah, that, that was great confirmation because yeah. that, that's not how I look. That's not how I feel. That's how the data represented me. So uh, how, how did people that you know that you love co-workers family friends respond to your really dramatic weight loss uh and health reversal in 20 months yeah the, um it's funny like the my friends at work they were like cheering me on they're like wow anthony you look great and i, I really would hesitate to tell anyone something like that because not like i didn't you know i didn't think you looked great before you know yeah. it was a very professional environment but um, I got plenty of that, which felt good. Um, I got everything from my, my, I have friends who thought I was sick, you know, and really I think they just wanted to tease me and like tell me that I looked like I was sick yeah. because it was pretty quick. You know, that's rapid weight loss and going from always having been obese. And then I also, I shaved my beard at the time, you know, like, so it was, it was a big change, but um aside from the joking and the kidding around, which I would fully expect from my friends, um, everyone was really genuinely, sincerely happy for me. And, uh, and that was awesome. Right. So was anybody not? Um, you know, what happened is some of my friends who, um, I used to talk about health conditions with who had not done the same thing, right. Who still hadn't figured out their part. Um, I would just sense uh, like we, the conversations would be a little bit kind of defensive mm -hmm. or like justifying why they are still doing what they're doing versus me doing what I'm doing. I didn't feel an ounce of that. You know, I wasn't, I would, wouldn't come with that, but right. I understand it from their perspective. So you didn't become like preachy or pushy or no, right? No, I'm, I'm, I like, I like to help people do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big kind of tell other people what to do kind of person. Right. Try not to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It must be hard, though, when you're such a poster boy for what whole food plant-based nutrition yeah. can do when you, when you do it and you do it right. And oh. how, 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 how can people not say? Yeah. So anyone who asked, yeah. I mean, they got the full thing. Right. I mean, they would get the daily phone calls. They would get the text messages in the morning, you know, later when we were using texts and stuff. I would offer to, you know, take them to lunch every single day. You know, like right. anybody who extended a little bit of interest, like I was there for them. Yeah. 100%. And that's why I've always been so, um, so happy to have the opportunity to share my story with the hope that it helps somebody else. Yeah. Or that it would even cause someone to ask me or ask someone else some questions on how they can do, how they could do it for themselves. And how did, uh, it sounds like your wife's just incredible, but yeah. how did, how did she react to this weight loss? So it was still, so she was very happy. Um, the, it's one of the moms at the preschool that we were taking the kids who thought that she remarried oh, gosh. <laughs> and she's like, and, and she it gave her like a, you go girl kind, kind of thing like that. Not even realizing that I was the same person, you know? It, so there was some of that. She, she was happy. But again, just in a supportive way, she was ha more happy that I was happy. She wasn't so happy where she was dissatisfied before. But where, where she got a little bit changed, because I mentioned I started running, um, she ran all through high school and, and um, she didn't run in college, but she ran while she was going to college, like, you know, recreationally for fun. And she, want, she started to change her diet after I started beating her at 5Ks and local races 
I was pushing both kids in the stroller yeah. and she still couldn't beat me. And I'd never ran in my life before, yeah. like ever. And she was like, wow, maybe there's something to this. And, uh, you know, we would go to the diner in New Jersey. She would order the Yankee pot roast dinner. I would order the Greek salad with no cheese, no dressing and no anchovies. Right. right? right. And they would come and they would put the salad in front of her. And they would put the Yankee pot roast dinner in front of me and we would have to trade plates, you know. That's good. But, but she knew that the food I was eating was delicious, mm-hmm. you know, because she was eating it too. Just that when we would go out, she would still go for sushi or she would still get, you know, like I said, she would get um, meat dishes. But she then she like she fully switched and she felt just as great too. She didn't change much in her size. I mean, she was never yeah. overweight and now she's still not overweight. She didn't go underweight at all. But um, her running improved quite a bit. She um, qualified for Boston six years in a row. Uh, She ran two marathons a year during that period. And um, she would qualify every year. And then every other year she would run it. And she would run a different marathon other years just by choice. But she really, you know, so she leveled up quite a bit with her own athletic performance. And and again, I just can't say enough about how when you get the inside right, Mm -hmm that you can just do everything that you want to do. You can just do a little bit better. So she's all in now. Yes. Yeah. And the kids too. We and, raised and, the kids and, the same Henry way. Henry and Evan. Yep. Wow. Yeah. So, and how old are they now? Now they're 17 and 19 years old. Wow. Yeah. So Evan just finished his freshman year of college. He just yeah. came home last week and the Henry's finishing up his junior year of high school right now. They both ran cross country all through all uh, cross country and track all through high school. Wow. Yeah. And so they're playing strong. Yes, uh, for sure. Young stud athletes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. You, you said something a second ago about how <clears throat> I think some of your friends or s- somebody didn't recognize you. Yeah. It, it reminds me, there, there, was an, there was a fire. I was doing an event in Sarasota, Florida. And this guy came up to me after the event. And he goes, man, you got to meet this firefighter at Fire Station 2. Sarasota, because this cat follows you so hardcore, you would not believe it. Really? And he's down over 100 pounds in one year. Wow. Following, you know, yeah. the Engine 2 program. And so I was, you know, you got to reach out to somebody that's, of that, you know, that's had that kind of success. And I did. And he went, went on to tell me about how he would go to these all-you-could-eat buffets. And his goal was to, like, basically show them how much he could eat, right? And these guys, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to show them. And that was just the attitude that he had. Yeah. And he said at some point he just had an awakening. He bought a size, I think he was a size uh, 50 waist, wow. right? Wow, wow. But he, put a, he, bought, he went to the store, he bought a size 32-inch waist. And he said he put it on the chair next to his bed. Oh, my god! And so it was the last thing that he saw every night before he went to bed and the first thing he saw when he woke up. And he said what happened is he hurt his knee in a fire. Yeah. And so they put, wow. him, they put him on injured reserve, so he had to work like a desk job for a year. In one year, and he said, I couldn't exercise. Oh. I was just following whole food, plant-based. I lost 102 pounds, got into those 32-inch pants, went back back to work at my station yeah and the guys had no idea who i was they thought i was a rookie a new rookie that's amazing but it it is it is incredible sometimes uh what what can happen yeah now sometimes that's uh, fun because you can walk right past people you don't want to talk to (laughs) but uh, yeah um do you, it, it, do you always have the beard or what's the No, what's it the comes and goes. It? Yeah. it comes. My wife really likes it. I, I, I like it a little bit less, but, she, you know, it seems like every time she says, oh, I really like your beard, then it kind of it goes really? away for a little while. Nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. So how did this journey of yours and finding whole food plant-based, you know, having this incredible success, how has it affected your your profession, your career, and what you're now doing with your life. Yeah. So I, I mentioned I was working at Novartis Pharmaceuticals. So when I left Maryland, moved to New Jersey, the pharmaceutical industry started caring about genetics and genomics, and they also didn't have anyone who knew how to work with the data. So it was a nice, it was a really nice fit. I felt great about that because I'm like, wow, now instead of contributing towards basic research, now I can contribute towards real medications and therapies that are going to help people to get well. Meanwhile, I'm working there, sick as I've ever been, right? 
and I learned how to recover. I got off medications that I told I was told I was going to be on forever. And I'm on this campus in New Jersey that's 500 acres and almost 10,000 people just work in this one location. We're 120,000 people worldwide at Novartis, right? And wow. I would walk around, I would say about 80% of what we're doing here is just to enable people, just enables people not to take care of themselves. If we didn't have the medications for pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, you yeah. know, like people will be forced to deal with it in a different way. Same, you know, same thing with high cholesterol, same thing with obesity. So, so, so many, you know, some of the, the heart disease, right? Like uh, blood pressure medications, all these things. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that necessarily from like a scientific perspective, but at least that's how I was thinking about it. Like well, it's, I, it's the path I, of least resistance. Right. right. And the medications helped me. Like if I wasn't on that medication, I probably wouldn't have felt well enough to make this change. Right. But, but, I was now wanted to kind of evolve my passion one more step. Now, instead of helping to develop drugs, now I would like to help people not to need drugs mm -hmm. or hopefully to get off of drugs. Um, it so what year are we in now? So that, well, that was probably from about the time I, you know, so I finished losing the weight to September 2007. So I probably really started thinking about this all around like 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't know where I was going to fit in. Like, the whole food plant-based community didn't start caring about gen genetics data and genomics data. So I wasn't going to plug directly in. I was trying to figure out what to do. I was helping a lot of people. I did go for a health coaching certification. I thought maybe I could do something yeah. with coaching. Um, and then um, my wife watched the documentary, The Minimalists. Right. And, and here we are living in New Jersey. I mentioned we had this big piece of property. We had a big house. We had a barn, a garden, skateboard ramp in the yard. We had all this stuff. And then we had all the stuff that you need to take care of, all that stuff. And I had almost jokingly said to her before that if we didn't have all this stuff, then like we wouldn't need to make a lot of money to be able to live the exact same kind of quality of life. So, so she she came to the idea. I didn't try to push that one on anyone, Rip. Yeah. That might have, that might have been a game changer for my personal, you know, for my uh, um, marital situation. But um, but in 2018, I left Novartis um, with a loose plan to figure out somewhere I was going to fit into this. But by that time, I felt like I could do that as a responsible parent because we had gotten rid of all of our everything that created the expense for us. You know, right. we bought a tiny condo. That, that we were able to just, you know, that we were not to have a mortgage on or anything. So, so um, she was still working part-time for NIH. She still does uh, today, right. but that was enough to, to keep us, you know, uh, happy and, and comfortable while I figured out what to do. And in 2018, I would go around to conferences and I just noticed a pattern. And what happened is when, when you, you would see a, a physician or a doctor who, or a scientist who would go on stage that would talk about you know, everything that we've learned about how whole food plant-based nutrition and how now lifestyle medicine can help to prevent disease or even reverse disease. Then they present some case studies, stories like mine, stories like other people. Dr. Stancic would talk about how, you know, her and her multiple sclerosis, right? Yeah, yeah. And then they go to Q&A and someone raises their hand yeah. and they say, hello, my name is so-and-so. And I also suffer from whatever medical condition, where can I find a doctor who can help me? And there's almost crickets. Yeah. Like there's rare situations. Your father's an incredible, yeah. right? Like resource for people with heart disease and they can have consultations with him. I mean, I have personal friends who have had that, you know, with, with him for free. But, but as far as I know, he's not going to take over their medical care and right. be their doctor. Right. Right. And so, so, you know, in Dr. Furman had this office in New Jersey. Now he has a retreat center. Dr. McDougall has his space set up here. And like there, there are people scattered around, but there's no, there's not easy access. So I just kind of put one and one together. And I said, well, you know, with telemedicine, this is back in 2019, wow. early, January 2019. Your with, timing could not have been better. With, yeah, with telemedicine, yeah. we can have a doctor who has multiple licenses, and and they can see patients in three or four states back to back. Right. Right. And maybe I knew a lot of doctors who wanted to practice lifestyle medicine, and I knew a lot of people who wished that their doctor practiced lifestyle medicine. The two groups didn't have a place to meet. 
and and that's what that's what we created. It started off as it was called plant based telehealth, and now it's called love life telehealth. And so how did and, how did how did that transition? Well, well uh, yeah, take well, place. Well, um, you know, I started it with uh, my partner at the time, Lori Marbus, yeah, and um, Dr. Christina Miller and Dr. Michael Clapper, and slowly they accumulated more states. We became national. And we brought on more doctors. Right now, we're right now we have ten doctors. Wow. They can see patients in all fifty states, and they can do international consultations. And we were doing that as plant-based telehealth. And then um, we got a lot of interest. You know, people wanted to invest in us. I honestly didn't know exactly what that meant. Yeah. You know, um, we I knew we needed to grow, but you know, I was learning as I was going. You know, how to, how to build and grow grow this company. And then we were um, approached by uh, Betsy Foster and John Mackey, and who and wants those to do the same the, thing. For those that don't know, John is the former now yes. CEO of Whole Food Market Stores, who stepped down in September of 2022, and uh, quite an entrepreneur. Yes, <laughs> he's an, an, an incredible person, you yeah. know, and an uh, incredible collaborator. So we have been in conversations on and off. Um, for about a year on, can we work together? Because it turns out that they were on the same mission. Mm. Like the mission is to change the way healthcare is practiced. Um, we were a little bit further along, but their vision was much, much more grand nice. than, than what we were doing. And at some point it just made sense to, to partner and to do it together. So, um, so we, we kind of, we jumped in with them, you know, and, and, and they acquired plant-based telehealth. We've just rebranded it as Love Life Telehealth. And we still have the ten, same 10 doctors who are seeing patients in all 50 states in international consultations. So anyone can go right now and have an appointment. And what we're working on now is how can we design um, other programs and offerings, including like a monthly, you know, like a monthly model like a year-long program that that patients can pay monthly over time to be part of a longer term experience where we can really help to provide the full set of support not just the not just the doctor the medical care but also coaching and education and community how can we really provide that um to help to, just to give everyone a better chance of being I would, successful. And I would really say treat- those are the three yeah. legs of that stool right there. The coaching, the community, and the, uh, and the education. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what, what, so what's the website if people are interested and they want to learn more? It's love.life slash telehealth. And I'm sure, you know, we can... Uh, Is that backslash, some- forward, forward slash? Oh, forward what? slash. Love.life. It's yeah. like instead of dot com, it's dot life. So it's love.life. And the whole idea behind that is we want to help people not just to live life, but to love life, to love. be passionate about enjoying their, enjoying it. Like, you know, the, the way I'm, is, I'm so excited about how I was able to, you know, yeah. to live and enjoy my life while I was raising my family. And, and still to this day, we want people to really uh, feel and experience that. So it's love.life forward slash telehealth. And, uh, or if you just go to love.life, then there's a button there that, to get to telehealth. Wow. And, the, and the doctors are, yeah, doctors That's, are available to see patients everywhere. And they're, they're some of the most incredible yeah. people that I've had the opportunity to work with. Just like I shared earlier, working with those scientists at NIH. Yeah, right. Just like working with these, uh, you know, these uh, drug investigators at, at, at Novartis trying to figure out how to target these, you know, these illnesses with medications. These guys are just as passionate but what they're doing is helping people to like mm-hmm. really thrive and to figure out the nuances around any kind of medical conditions that they're dealing with and using a lifestyle first approach and relying medi- on medicine when it's absolutely necessary in some, you know, in some cases. Well, I think that you have to be extraordinary to be able to move outside the box yes. that you were you're kind of painted into as a medical student and realize at some point that the uh, traditional medical bag that I've been given isn't the best method of delivering results to these patients that I've sworn an oath to, the Hippocratic Oath. And so it takes somebody big to be able to go, you know what, Uh, I'm going to look at the data. I'm going to like see what works and by, by God, this is the answer. 
And, yep. and so, you know, um, more and more, I think physicians are practicing lifestyle medicine, Yeah, but you've got, you know, the early well, wave. Well, and we've got the early wave and we've got an environment that's set up to support them. The shortest mm-hmm. appointment is 30 minutes and that's 30 minutes of time with the doctor. Right. Right. And they, they get to know the patient before the appointment because we've got a complete intake questionnaire which doesn't just ask about what your parents, you know, what conditions they've had and what conditions you've had in the past, but now it asks you, what does a typical day, typical day of eating look like? What's your physical activity? Where do you have strong and, and um, social connections? Where do you find joy in your life? You know, what do you do for physical activity? And they take all of that and they put that into a complete package for people. So now they really get to know you before the appointment. Now you can start working together and you can, you know, they can ask clarifying questions to understand. And then it's the patient's goal. Like, what do you want to achieve? Like, Oh, I would, I would love to, you know, lower my cholesterol without medication, or I would love to, I just was diagnosed pre-diabetic. I'd love to not become type two diabetic, you know, and they have, they can work with the patients to do all these things. I had a swimming buddy that he had his, I mean, complete blood work done, like from A to Z. And he's whole food plant based. He had about six or seven markers that he had some questions on. So I sent him to Christina Miller. Yes. To basically with a thirty minute appointment, so we could just go over those and and they could all be addressed. Like for example, a low white blood cell count, which when you're whole food plant based, right, sometimes is very very natural yeah. and absolutely fine. But he was able to have all these um, concerns addressed, and he feels so much better for it. So, yeah, see, and and, and, and and here's and here's a physician that specializes in whole food plant based, right. and can understand you know the, the nuances of the numbers, right? Because if he went to another doctor, just you know, a, a regular you know um, family practitioner or something, they might start asking him questions like, "Where are you going to get your protein?" or right. Right. "How are you going to get enough calcium?" You're going to develop osteo. Like they can just confuse the situation and still, to your point, never answer the real question that he wants to know the answers to is like. Is this because the way I'm eating in my lifestyle, and is it actually a risk factor for me? Totally. Or not, right? So it sounds like he got the. It's not, you know, because of probably because of this whole suite of everything else. Yep. That she's able to make that determination. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, So it sounds to me, I I love uh, that you're now like. You're loving what you're doing. You're you're loving life. But like it, loving it's, dot life. <laughs> love dot life. Yeah. And and um yeah, it just feels like everything is doing what is where it's supposed to be. To have my personal career aligned. I almost felt like I lived dual lives before. Mm. You know, I would be working on, on on pharmaceutical research during the day and then the evening I would be going to speak at you know um at one of Dr. Furman's new events in New Jersey yeah. to help people to understand the power of lifestyle. And and it was they were never really like conflicting. I wasn't hiding one from the other ever, but but they weren't aligned. And now it just feels like everything is aligned. And yeah. um and it's a it's a wonderful place to be. Wow. What a yeah. And I get to help people in a way that I really, really yeah. truly believe in. Yeah. Well, you know, you and I go back, you came to yeah. Plan Stock. In 2017, I think it was the last one up in uh, Claverdack. Yeah, and there was a bunch of you guys, a bunch of yeah. former big big boys. Yes, that got up well, and, and and talked. And well, there was also a, like a little mini documentary that was made starring you guys. Too, yes, yes, that correctly. was big. Change the film. That was our yeah. friend Jason. Yeah, and um, and that was Tim Kaufman and Josh, Josh Lajani. Yeah, Lajani. I mean Josh Lajani. I I give him a lot of credit for getting a lot of us together. Yeah. Um, we, we all kind of started to know each other, you know, at different phases of our journey. And he created what was called the Missing Chins That's Running right. Club. And uh, we got to get together in Colorado a few times to do some runs together. But, I mean, it was always so nice. And I'm sure you experienced this. That, but somebody who has made this kind of change for themselves and somebody who, like the passion that you develop for life and for mm-hmm. and the appreciation for being able to go for a run, do something that simple. The appreciation for being able to sit in an armchair right now, like like to talk to be around 10 or 12 or 15 people or maybe, you know, over 100 of us when we're just online, you know, in in these in our Facebook group. Like not having to explain these things to people was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I, I like we had a blast up at Plant Stock and it, that was an incredible experience yeah, in yeah. itself. It, it really was. Well, I've got to yeah. go pick up my daughter. Oh, yeah. 
and uh, I've got to go I, back I, to work. And you've got to go back to work. But this has been spectacular. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming on the show, being so open and uh, and, share, and sharing you know this incredible uh, life journey uh, and transformation with us. Thank you. And I wish you all the best with Love Life Telehealth. Like, knock it out of the park. You guys got an amazing service, and I hope people take advantage of it. Thank you. I appreciate it, Rip. Thanks so much for having me. It's been so much fun talking with you. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I, I just hope it, I hope it helps. Oh, yeah. Can't, yeah. can't but. Yeah. All right. Give me a little, little plant strong love in there. Plant Boom. strong. All right. See you. Thanks. I want to thank Anthony for answering the call and connecting the dots on a huge need, which is access to plant-based physicians. Doctors are now available to see patients in all 50 U.S. states and Washington, D.C., and for lifestyle medicine consultations internationally. You simply visit love.life to learn more. And that's it, love.life. No .com, no anything like that. It's just love.life. All right. Thanks, as always, for listening. I'll see you next week. In the meantime, keep it plant strong. Thank you for listening to the Plant Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.